about in this session of what has happened to the old way of doing business in the world. Are we, as some on the left argue, in a new, maybe more morally driven international order in which international affairs are less bounded by narrow interests? And indeed, one of the uh, criticisms that's often levelled against China in terms of its uh, behaviour in Africa is that here we see the Kind of the, the example of brutal old-fashioned real politic where states intervene in pursuit of their own interests and this is no longer accepted. However, so are we seeing a new morally driven international order or are we in a new international context in which the ad hoc and impetuous behaviour of statesmen and women unanchored by any clear sense of interest is actually ironically creating a more dangerous and unstable international order. So these are some of the questions uh, that we would like to ask and to help us to think about some of these questions and discuss the issues we have a fantastic panel uh, on my right here we have Kerry Brown who leads the Europe China Research and Advice Network and is head of the Asia program at Chatham House he joined the Foreign Office in 1998 working on the Greater China Desk becoming first secretary at the British Embassy uh, Beijing, and head of the Indonesia, East Timor and Philippines section at the Foreign Office. Um, Dr. Brown holds numerous academic posts, including at SOAS, Nottingham University, Cambridge and the LSC. And he's also the author of numerous books on China, most lately Ballot Box China, Village Democracy in the PRC. And he's just finished a political biography of Hu Jintao, which will be published early next year. On my left, uh, we have Dame Anne Leslie, uh, a veteran foreign correspondent who has reported from more than 70 countries, too many even to begin to list over the last 40 years. She is a frequent broadcaster on radio and television, and at the Reuters Press Gazette launch of the Newspaper Hall of Fame, she was named as one of the most influential journalists of the last 40 years. She has won many awards, including the James Cameron Prize for International Reporting for, quote, work that combined moral vision and professional integrity and a Lifetime Achievement Award in 1997 from the Media Society, which stated, Anne Leslie is only the third person to receive the honour, the, the two previous winners being Sir Alistair Cook and David, Sir David Attenborough. Her memoir, Killing My Own Snakes, was described by The Guardian as vivid, as a vivid, absorbing book, which, like Leslie's best journalism, conveys what it's like to live through wars, civil conflicts, oppression and historic change. Now, next to Kerry, um, I'm pleased to introduce Carl Eric Norman, who is a Swedish diplomat and opera singer and author, so a Renaissance man, certainly. He's had a diplomatic post from Moscow to Beijing and everywhere in between, and is responsible for Swedish development assistance to Asia, humanitarian and emergency aid and multilateral cooperation through the UN, the World Bank, and regional banks. He has also founded in 2001, the only <coughs> pan-European forum and think tank for cultural personalities from all sections of the art. He's on the board of several NGOs and is author of more than 20 books on international topics. And his latest book, A Better Life on Earth, is in the process of being published this month. Next to Carl Eric, on the far right, is uh, Mark Seddon. He's a former UN United Nations correspondent and New York bureau chief for Al Jazeera English TV. He's reported from 18 countries during that time, and he's interviewed everyone from Ban Ki-moon to George Clooney, so a wide <laughs> range of... Uh, into In a journalistic career spanning over 20 years, Mark has been editor of Tribune an elected, and an elected member of the UK's Labour Party National Executive Committee. He has written, again, for most British newspapers and most magazines, which I cannot list now, they're too numerous, and has also reported for, amongst others, the BBC and Sky TV. So very welcome. And last, but certainly not least, on my far left here, we have uh, Brendan O'Neill, who is the editor of the online magazine Spiked. He's a columnist for The Big Issue in Britain and for The Australian, which is in Australia, of course. He also writes a daily blog for The Daily Telegraph, <coughs> in spite of the fact that, according to The Guardian, he is a Marxist proletarian firebrand. So there we have it. So welcome to uh, all our speakers. Thank you very much. So without 
further ado, Mark, may I ask you to kick us off? I was thinking because I'm I'm just old enough to to uh, to recall um, that the world was a very different place 40 odd years ago, and everything that throughout my life has seemed to be certain and the next development has never really panned out that way. <coughs> I, mean, I, I make no apology that some things remain certain to me. I I, I believe that. Uh, I'm an internationalist, essentially. I think we should all try and be internationalists if we can. Uh, I remain on the, uh, the left of politics, but so many of the certainties that uh, I sort of grew up with um, seem less so. I mean, I was born in 1962, which is, doesn't make me, I suppose, that old. It makes me middle-aged. But in 1962, uh, much of sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean was still under British colonial rule. My father served in the British Army on the Rhine in West Germany at a time when um, the world was essentially divided between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, and there was a struggle essentially uh, between uh, democracy and communism. These certainties seemed to go on forever. They were never going to change. The Berlin Wall was always going to be there. I used to read Anne when she was writing about being in the GDR, uh, and you know, who, who could ever have thought that all of that would fall away? And then we had, um, this is a bit of a potted history, I'll keep it short because I've only got five minutes, but Francis Fukuyama <laughs> five to seven. Telling, telling us about the end of history. Uh, suddenly that all ideology, all ideas were over. There was a settled new will. We were going to live in the glorious high uplands of essentially the free market settlement. Uh, and a, a type of democracy would uh, always prevail. And that sort of lasted five minutes. And in, you know, in this sort of period of time, we've seen the rise of the European Union. We've seen the rise of certain countries within the European Union and the fall of others. We've seen the creation of the Eurozone and the near collapse. And I, I had to say last night when I was watching the television and hearing that uh, uh, senior Europeans were rushing off to Beijing in order to encourage <coughs> the Chinese to buy Euro bonds, I suddenly started thinking about that program. I think it was called um, Euro Trash. Do you remember it? <laughs> the Chinese should be careful. But there again, I mean, we've seen something else. I mean, we've seen the collapse of a Stalinist system, and yet the authoritarian systems remaining in countries like China, arguably um, morphing into something uh, that could be described as market level. Uh, no, no democracy, but uh, a sort of fundamental uh, sort of free market. Well, not just it's not it's a mixture, as we know. It's a, it's a, it's a very very powerful uh, economic mixture that seems to be uh, a, a predominant in many ways. But I just wonder if we've seen. And we also had the American century. It wasn't all that long ago when serious people in Washington really believed that this was going to be America century, and America's foreign policy was written about it. And it, and it went from uh, uh, armed intervention or invasion of Iraq to today, where the United States can, <coughs> is trying to withdraw uh, as well it can and replace its security policy by unmanned drones. So don't things move so very, very quickly? And it does just leave me with one idea, actually, that... Uh, well, I mean, I think there's a vast amount of obscurantism that goes on. I think in many ways, so much that we are uh, fed or what we read or what we are asked to believe uh, is almost, because there's so much information, designed to confuse. And actually, we end up in this sort of uh, rather confused world where we don't seem to know what's going on and we can't possibly have opinions. And we can blame it all on the 24-hour news culture and uh, an, ability, an inability of anybody to sort of really get to grips with things. I suppose that was most visible with what we saw just the other day with uh, Mrs. Uh, Sarkozy and Merkel smirking at Silvio Berlusconi. <laughs> I mean, there you have it, really. I mean, could you imagine 40, 50 years ago or longer ago that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, news being picked up and paraded across the world? It wouldn't have been. And so the, yes, of course, those discussions those uh, diplomatic niceties, or not very niceties, are reported uh, in full colour and right before us. And of course, they do drive events in a massive way. Uh, but it does enable those societies and those countries that don't have such a free media, such as China perhaps, to take a longer view.
I would say uh, that we obviously we haven't moved into a new world order. We've moved into an incredibly confused uh, situation uh, and a very, very volatile one. Because in a way, it's not about the rise of the, of the Americas or the fall of the Americas or the rise of China or the rise of Korea or whatever. It is about the rise of the masters of the universe, the masters of global capital, who have, they don't need drones, they just have buttons and they can switch capital uh, at a touch. And clearly that's what's been happening for a very long time because the victor, perhaps, of the last 20, 30 years has been a complete, uh, unfettered, free market. I would call it klepto-capitalism. And in the battle between um, forces on the planet now, uh, if it's between market Leninism and uh, klepto-capitalism, I suspect we know the answer as to who's going to win in the meanwhile. Um, I, at this sort of stage, I should try and come up with some ideas about how we can get resolution, how we can temper the power of various global forces. I'm not, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to try and get involved in that argument, but I did spend two and a half years at the United Nations, uh, an organisation, a bit like the Commonwealth, by the way, which seems to have popped back into sort of public uh, view this past two or three days as uh, commentators see the, the European Union falling to bits. The United Nations, despite all of its failings, and its, uh, its failings are largely down to uh, its uh, membership. The United Nations is not a single body, as you know, it's the sum of its parts. But uh, I think the United Nations must be part of a solution. And just in parting, I mean, we have seen the rise of international law. We have seen the creation of an international criminal court. We have seen... Uh, uh, Milosevic and other authoritarian figures put on trial in The Hague, and I would like to have seen, as many of us would, Gaddafi put on trial in The Hague. That's got to be progress. We've also seen responsibility to protect develop out of the disaster of Rwanda and of Yugoslavia. And that's got to be a progress too, and we should welcome that. And, and finally, I would simply say on that basis, we have got to, we have got to encourage the rise of internationalism and international law. I would simply use the argument of Iraq and Libya because Tara mentioned Libya. I was totally opposed to the military intervention in Iraq. I spent a miserable time on Labour's national executive with Tony Blair and others back then. I spent some time going uh, and speaking to people at the UN and trying to get, uh, in a small way, the Labour Party to accept the rule of international law, uh, which was broken. The question of Libya, of course, is a different matter because the United Nations Security Council voted for intervention then, and I think we must look towards the UN uh, for the future in many ways. I'll now ask uh, Kerry to take the I think there's a classical Chinese text called Tianwen, that means questions from heaven, which in, <laughs> consists entirely of questions, no, no short statements at all. So I'm going to try and sort of copy that in a way by just coming up with lots, lots of questions. I can really talk about Asia and I can really talk about China. So I guess my sort of you know, focus will really be on well, what are we going to be dealing with? Um, and I think, you know, I work for a think tank, so we're part of the entertainment sector rather than the uh, serious commentariat. And, you know, we deal uh, with the future. And so I think, you know, since 1978, it's absolutely indisputed that the Communist Party of China has been able to deliver uh, a kind of factory of GDP growth. This is, no one disputes this. And every single elite leader in Beijing uh, over the years has said the key priority for the party is to deliver economic productivity, and that's been successful. But I think we can see now a big transformation, a big transition, and that is that we are going to enter with a leadership transition next year of the Politburo into an era of deeper socio-political change. And that will have a big impact on China and on our world. Because anything in China, even in the 31 provinces or autonomous regions, will have an impact on our world. Since China entered the World Trade Organization in November 2001, when I was an official in Beijing, uh, it, has er it has entered an era of deep contention. And we call those the nine nines, but the three nines, basically. Nine million petitions to the central government next year by people in provinces who are dissatisfied by the treatment of their cases by local officials, most of those about property rights. Um, 93 billion US dollars spent on internal security, one billion more than is spent on China's international defense. 90 million mass incidences. So a great deal of contention, dissatisfaction with the legal structures which are there to try and deal with contention in society. Um, so we have to sort of think of, well, how, how does China kind of resolve these internal issues? 
Um, but we also have to think of what is its view of itself, what's the view of the kind of different classes and the class structures in China which have been produced by this sort of era of, you know, very, very kind of dynamic change, a kind of change which is unprecedented in a human society in, you know, any, any period. Industrialization, a kind of shift towards uh, urbanization, 50% of Chinese now live in cities, and a kind of deep change in the sort of social structure. Um, first of all, it was interesting, uh, the Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs, Fu Ying, uh, when the Europeans went with their begging bowl yesterday to Beijing, um, said something about, um, we must move from the shadow of history. And I wonder, you know, whether this sort of, you know, kind of alludes firstly to um, a sense of victim mentality, which is very strong amongst Beijing officials and the Beijing elite, a sense of historic grievances. So Liu Yan, uh, general for the People's Liberation Army, who may well enter the Central Military Commission, a very powerful position, wrote an absolutely extraordinary thing in a book published earlier this year about the blood debt. Uh, for Chinese, the blood debt against their neighbors, the blood debt against the historic grievances that started um, from the history of humiliation in 1840, and the idea of a sort of um, sense of rectifying those historic grievances. The second thing is a kind of um, expectation uh, by uh, China that with, with this moment uh, of the Europeans needing uh, money and the, China, uh, the, the um, Chinese holding so many US Treasury bonds, that there should be a more equitable international structure, and that's sort of been you know, intensifying over the last two months, and a kind of disdain, really, for the sort of moral lectures that they have been receiving from other leaders, a kind of feeling that the discourse is not particularly sophisticated, that there needs to be a better way of trying to talk to China, there needs to be better frameworks uh, within which to deal with China. But we don't have a kind of framework to deal with a country which is developing, but also very wealthy, which is the world's second biggest economy, but the 96th in terms of per capita GDP, a country which uh, one commentator called, you know, the world's first rich, poor country, the world's first country that will grow old before it grows rich, that will poison itself before it grows rich. These are sort of, you know, difficult things to fit into a kind of appropriate um, policy friendly kind of, in, you know, a, a, a kind of a structure uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with China as a, as, as a sort of, um, you know, outsider. And I suppose also um, the final thing really is, um, what does China say about itself? Well, uh, Weibo, which is the Chinese version of Twitter, um, has increased its usage from 40 million users at the beginning of the year to 200 million uh, by now. If you look at the kind of Facebook, you know, sort of coverage of the world, you'll see a big black hole in the middle of it, which is China. I mean, Facebook is basically blocked in China, thank God. And basically, <coughs> um, you know, uh, Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter, um, does something which is absolutely extraordinary. Um, for the first time in history, we have a kind of map of Chinese public opinion. Uh, we've always had people stand as proxies or representatives or talking on behalf of what is Chinese public opinion. But in fact, with Weibo, we have a pretty good audit for what is Chinese opinion about certain things. And the two things that strike me as very powerful coming from what Weibo bloggers and people who tweet on Weibo do um, is, first of all, a real fury with elites. And not just elites outside of China, with elites inside China. So one of the most famous bloggers, Wang Xiaodong, wrote a book earlier uh, in 2009, just after the Olympics, called uh, Unhappy China. Uh, I think this is an adult audience, so I mean, we translate it as China is pissed. And basically, um, he kind of writes about uh, you know, the fury of um, Chinese, their own elites, who have, he said, created a structure in which we have become the sweatshop for the world, in which our blood, sweat, and tears are being used to waste our money by foreign investments or involved in foreign kind of activities uh, in which we are not getting a just return. And that voice, I'm going to make one prediction, that voice is going to be a very, very powerful one in the years ahead. Uh, because the Chinese government, however repressive and restricted it is, and it is at the moment going through a big period of repression because of all of the uncertainties, it's got to listen to that voice. And someone, has, someone said uh, in Beijing when I was there in June, what saves us from unmitigated Chinese nationalism is the nine suited members of the Politburo. Once they go, I think we see all of these issues of a visceral kind of um, you know, Chinese anger. And I mean, I think that we have to deal with that. And I think the um, final thing, really, um, is you know, a sense of justice. Uh, we can go on and on about you know, the issues of human rights, and th that some of those are very legitimate. But we've got to recognize, too, the things that we see in Weibo about Chinese anger at injustice, not only in their own country, a kind of deep injustice at local officials. One local official who astonishingly managed to accrue 146 lovers I mean, he must have been a tired man. No wonder he needed to have a fast trade network. I mean, absolutely extraordinary. 
So as Joel, uh, Joel Ruijin, who is um, a former editor of the People's Daily wrote, you know, the kind of Chinese hunger for justice is something that I think we can recognize, that we can link with, that we can have policies that respond to, that we can talk to with absolute equality, because I think it responds also and reflects our own hunger for justice and, uh, uh, and anger at injustice. Very finally, um, there is a famous story about a former Politburo member, um, Li Changchun, um, who uh, went to a factory, um, I think in the 1990s, that made tractors. And he noticed that the uh, name of the tractors uh, was, um, the, I think the brand name was Flying Forward. And he said, that's a fantastic name. Why did you choose that? And the um, factory owner said, because we don't know how to make um, reverse gear. Uh, and basically, I think that this is the problem. Uh, we have this extraordinary, dynamic, incredible kind of, um, uh, you know, project really of, uh, of which China is embarked upon, which is deeply impacting on our world, but there isn't really any reverse gear. Thank you. A starting point, uh, I wish to um, <coughs> emphasize that politicians, as, as you have noted, have relatively less power today than they used to have 30 or 40 years ago, and that people are, generally speaking, less interested in, uh, let's say, uh, parliamentarian politics than 30 or 40 years ago. That's a, an important platform for any discussion, I think. Uh, I wish to um, uh, start with a um, quotation from a Swedish playwright who had one of his protagonists saying, already in the 60s. Why do we need uh, diplomats when we have telephone? Well, he had a point already at that time, and since then, of course, the fax came, and since then, uh, then came the mobile telephones, uh, email, internet, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc., the whole social media. So you could really ask yourself, why do you, know, uh, that why do you need diplomats today? The so-called real diplomatie, or the, the traditional diplomacy, uh, of which I was a child uh, when I started foreign service in Sweden many years ago, was very much about secrets. Now, so uh, secrets uh, was, of course, uh, the, the way, the reason for the, the raison d'etre for diplomats, more or less. So at a very early stage, you had to le learn uh, cryptography. Uh, for your reporting from uh, various places of the world. I must confess that very early I was skeptic about the whole system because uh, I realized that about 90% of all secrets have only a time dimension. It's secret today, but uh, to uh, tomorrow it's, uh, it's uh, public uh, knowledge. But, and the, and the, quality, the quality dimension, the, the sort of real secrets which are uh, of a very sensitive nature and which are then remaining in the uh, secret archives for several decades, they were a tiny part of what we had to put the, the red secret stamp on. Um, other methods for secret uh, deliveries were, of course, the diplomatic pouch, the famous one I spent in the bad old 70s, some years in, in, the, in Beijing. And uh, as a Scandinavian diplomat there, we didn't have a direct SAS flight there, so we, uh, we had to, we were happy to, go by train every week down to Hong Kong to deliver this sealed pouch to uh, some very uh, reliable uh, SAS purser who took it back to our capitals. Uh, so these, these were the old time diplomas, which as, as you know, it goes back to uh, the uh, deliveries of messages between kings and emperors several hundred years ago or a thousand <laughs> years ago, uh, usually, uh, usually through diplomats who were financially independent noblemen. Uh, some people say that the salaries of today's uh, North European diplomats still reflect the fact that they believe that they are uh, financially independent. <laughs> in, uh, in wartime, which was most of the time, and also including the two big world war times in the uh, 20th century, uh, diplomacy was very often a cover-up for, for spying or for secret service, particularly, of course, between, the, say, the Warsaw Pact and the NATO diplomats. As a neutral Swedish diplomat, uh, I grew up in that environment, and it, it, it meant you always had a house uh, Russian, a house Pole, a house American, uh, who, who would uh, pay this uh, call to you, 
and uh, discuss and try to squeeze something out of you, and uh, it was, of course, vice versa. A Polish diplomat uh, in, in Peking once uh, uh, opened in order to, to create confidence by saying that, well, you know, Mr. Norman, I was uh, uh, handling with so many open issues and so many secret issues, so I do not know anymore which, which is the difference. <laughs> and of course, I was very confident after that. <laughs> this whole good old uh, diplomacy, as has been hinted already, stopped died, more or less, 1990, 1991, uh, after the, the, uh, the end of the Cold War. What is remains, or the exceptions, uh, from the, this, the fact that we don't have traditional diplomacy anymore is China, as mentioned, uh, uh, where politics is still strong, and where the, uh, they are trying all, they are playing on all parts of the instrument to defend their interests in the world, including some neo-colonial approaches here and there, particularly Africa. Iran is another uh, exception, uh, which uh, a country which is trying to def to uh, uh, to uh, have a bomb or not have a bomb, or defending that they have it or not have it. So it's a traditional dip, uh, diplomacy in that way. Turkey, I see as a tip, uh, typical traditional diplomacy now that they are trying to uh, create some, well, or they have, let's say they have some neo-Ottoman ambitions in the vacuum of the Med Middle East and North Africa. The United States, of course, as the, uh, the biggest power in the world, has to uh, refer to a lot of traditional diplomacy, but they have to redefine it a lot, and particularly redefine it after the disaster of the Iraq, Iraq War. And by the way, this Iraq War, of course, spoiled any chances or postponed any chances for the European Union to have a common, common foreign policy. It will take another few years, not only because of the finance crisis, but also because of the the, the fall down of the foreign policy will take some time before they have a global, uh, become a global player. So what do we have instead? Well, we have nation branding, and we have, um, uh, and that is particularly important for young states. We have cultural diplomacy. Cultural di diplomacy is selling, uh, with soft power, selling your arts and selling your values. Uh, and we also have, uh, rather prosaic, we have the increased role for consular matters. So the instructions of many foreign services uh, uh, tell these three are the important things. Analyzing situations in, in uh, the country X is less important. There are other sources for that. And particularly if you have foreign ministers like Carl Bildt in Sweden or Hillary Clinton in US who are uh, so uh, well informed themselves and who are so skilled in the uh, social media. This uh, total transparency of today, every, everything is everybody's business, is of course the opposite of the traditional uh, diplomacy. Politicians are relatively weaker because of globalization and the free financial markets. They have much less to say themselves and they are more dependent on the, com they become sort of Gallup-based politicians. And they have to listen to the market. The market is their law all the time. Or they ask celebrities to do the job as diplomats like BHL, uh, Bernard uh, Levy, who some people say started uh, the uh, Libyan war. <laughs> uh, the uh, United Nations, I'm finishing now, uh, the United Nations, the United Nations uh, remain, of course, the source, uh, the, the only place where you could have some sort of traditional diplomacy. But uh, how can we do that when at the same time 100 of these governments uh, are dictators or not democratic and we are supporting the opposition? Sweden, Sweden in 2011 spent 25 million euro on, on net activists uh, for democracy. So my, uh, uh, my final word is that we have to reorganize the United Nations, of course, to reflect today's uh, situation, not uh, particularly the Security Council, and somehow the hope for a, a better diplomacy is to have also a strong uh, common European foreign policy, uh, according, let's say, to traditional uh, European social democratic values. Thank you. If you want an insight into how unhinged uh, British foreign policy is, is these days, you need to look no further than the Libya intervention. Because what we have here is a really extraordinary situa situation where 
In the space of two years, British Prime Ministers went from hugging a foreign leader to gleefully announcing that his dead, battered body had been found outside a sewer. As late as uh, January 2009, Tony Blair, as we now know, was meeting with Gaddafi to discuss uh, business link-ups between Libya and the West. And then in October 2011, uh, David Cameron was attending a Diwali celebration at Downing Street, at which he boasted about his role in the death of the devil, Gaddafi, uh, and argued that Britain had just won a battle between good and evil. So in little more than two years, the leaders of Britain went from praising and embracing Gaddafi to leaping for joy when they heard that an angry crowd had beaten him to death. Now, in their attempt to explain this really schizophrenic foreign policy making, this shift from love to hate, commentators have tended to personalise the whole thing. They have simply put it down to the fact that some British leaders, namely the Blairites, made bad decisions on Libya, and other British leaders, namely the Cameroons, made good decisions. They made amends for what was done before. So many argue that Blair was simply wrong to meet Gaddafi. It was an error of judgment. Uh, you know, it's become fashionable everywhere now, from the Daily Mail to the Guardian, to mock Blair for snogging an evil dictator and making Britain look stupid in the process and everything else. And they argue that Cameron was right to bomb Libya. He was right to assist in the final elbowing aside of Gaddafi from the world stage. He rectified Britain's errors of judgment in relation to Libya and rescued our foreign policy uh, reputation. And this is a totally wrong way of looking at the Libya situation for two reasons. Firstly, because actually from a foreign policy perspective, uh, it wasn't Blair who acted irrationally and stupidly in relation to Gaddafi's regime. It was Cameron. Uh, from the point of view of Britain's for foreign policy interests and foreign policy needs, Blair's love-in with Gaddafi was actually fairly sensible. It was about securing certain deals uh, for the West while helping to shore up uh, a relatively uh, stable regime in North Africa. You know, that is what British foreign policy is largely about. It was Cameron, not Blair, who behaved in a rash, ridiculous and immature fashion in relation to Libya. Uh, you know, Cameron's decision to bomb was driven by a pretty reckless, childish desire for some fleeting moral glory, uh, you know, giving no regard at all to the fact that Britain's foreign policy establishment had spent the previous 10 years trying to improve uh, the image of Gaddafi's Libya. So where Blair's actions were, uh, to a certain extent, anchored by an instinctive recognition of what was in the British elite's interests in North Africa, Cameron's actions were driven by an extremely shallow, almost celebrity-style desire for a few front-page splashes and maybe for a uh, paragraph or two in, in history books. You know, it's a, it's a real testament to the political and diplomatic immaturity of politicians like Cameron that, uh, you know, these people have never fought a war and never really been involved in serious politics, that he could simply destroy 10 years of foreign policy outreach work for the benefit of five minutes of uh, media glory. Uh, and the second reason it's wrong to talk about Blair getting it wrong in Libya and, and Cameron getting it right is because it overlooks the more fundamental rot at the heart of Western foreign policy making today. It overlooks the decline and fall of old-fashioned realpolitik in international affairs. Because the whole Libya debacle is not simply a question of individual politicians making uh, individual decisions. It really it speaks to the complete hollowing out of foreign policy and the complete hollowing out of rail politic. Because we have a situation today where rail politic no longer really exists in any real sense. It has been replaced by a foreign policy guided by moralism and moral posturing rather than by the pursuit of interests. Uh, and this makes uh, foreign affairs a far more volatile and unpredictable thing than it was in the past, which is why you can have a situation uh, where uh, the British elite can have such great changeability over an issue like Libya. And the crisis facing foreign policy today is actually the same one facing all other forms of politics today, which is the devaluation of the politics of interest, the way in which uh, politics has become increasingly cut off from the pursuit of one's interests. You see this across the board uh, today, from the right to the left, uh, from the mainstream to the radical, <coughs> politics has been emptied of interests. Politics has become dissociated from national interests, class interests, group interests. Very few political parties and movements now openly claim to represent their own interests. 
Uh, you know, it's the in thing now to disavow your interests and claim to be acting on behalf of other people. So new political movements will claim to be acting on behalf of the biosphere or whales or unborn future generations. Uh, Left-wing groups in increasingly claim to speak on behalf of the voiceless poor and the powerless and the socially excluded and so on. Uh, you know, interests has been completely taken out of politics and politics in, in, as a result has become a highly moralised affair instead. And this is also the case in the arena of geopolitics. We have seen a real disavowal of self-interest. Foreign policy is no longer defined by national or bloc interests, but uh, has it rather by the open, active denial of those things, by the denial that one has interest and that one would ever pursue something so grubby as national uh, bloc interests. And as a result, geopolitics has effectively been silenced. It's kind of mutated into a moral crusade instead of a kind of uh, pursuit of real politic. And you can really see this with the rise of humanitarianism. With the, with the tyranny of humanitarian intervention that we've seen over the past 15 or so years. Because humanitarianism really represents the Western elite's adaptation to the withering of the politics of interest. It's really their way of pursuing foreign policy goals in a time when you can't openly claim to be pursuing your own interests. So it's a, it's a way of disavowing self-interest while at the same time having an impact in the, on the globe and on foreign affairs. And this was really best summed up by Tony Blair, uh, the king of humanitarian tyranny, uh, in relation to his bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, when he said, this is, a not, this is not a war for territory or resources, it is a war over values. A, it is a battle between good and evil. Now, he was unwittingly echoing uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who in 1984 <laughs> said about his war with Iraq, this is not a war for territory, this is a war of values between Islam and blasphemy. So, uh, you know, they're kind of borrowing from uh, that uh, tyrant. And this uh, removal of interest from the international sphere has an extremely destabilizing impact. Because interest was the great anchor of politics. Interests, the, the rational pursuit of your own interest was the thing that anchored politics for 200 or more years. And if you haven't got a clear interest to speak to, then you have no anchor. You can be pushed around by all sorts of forces and become much more susceptible to PR needs, to populism, to fleeting concerns. And that's why we have the situation like Libya, which was effectively a vanity project for Bernard Henri Levy and Samantha Power in America, and these you know, academics who love the idea of bombing tyrants. So you have an entire war, the massacre of hundreds of people, basically springing from the vanity project of uh, Western academics. Because in a world which is not grounded by geopolitical interests, which are clearly stated and clearly put forward, it's extremely destabilizing and foreign affairs can go all over the place. And we end up in a new era, effectively, of the barbarism of buffoons. You've just been talking about, you know, the death of sensible real politique and we've been overtaken by sort of this moralizing um, <coughs> bellicosity, actually. And I'm with you on Tony Blair. It brings me out in the hives, always has done. But, you know, real politique today is considered to be a rather dirty word, you know. It's, and that anyone who advocates it is a creature of no morals, no principles, no ideals. But I'm actually rather in favour of real politique because it does attempt to deal with life, with the messiness of human nature and reality rather than ignore it in a cloud of self-righteousness and cause more trouble than uh, the cause, uh, whatever it is that they're, they're arguing about, warrants. Now, perhaps precisely because I've worked in over 70 countries so far, I'm extremely suspicious of self-proclaimed idealists, Tony Blair, of course, included, whose assumption of virtue inevitably re leads to contempt and sometimes worse for those who don't agree with them. And, for example, whenever a politician anywhere in the world, including here, who says to me, Anne, you know, I'm really a deep dyed idealist at heart. I'm rather like the great Dr. Johnson, who says, anybody who says that sort of thing and proclaims his honour, well, go out and count the spoons and do so in a hurry. Um, now, I remember, for example, I was interviewing Comrade Gunter Shabovsky, 
of the East German uh, Politburo. It was after the fall of the workers and peasants' paradise uh, of East Germany, and he was awaiting prison for his role in that regime. I asked him how he could possibly justify the fact that he and his fellow communist bosses lived high off the hog in cheap accommodation, which was very luxurious, um, that they had private shopping um, opportunities, they could import Western goods, which no East German could ever get hold of. Uh, I mean, they went mad when they found their first pair of stonewashed jeans, would you believe, which was smuggled in as the place started to implode. Um, and they even had, the bosses, private hunting forests and private seaside resorts. Now, how could they justify this? And Shabovsky said, well, we believed that because we had to work so hard to achieve the ideals of real existing socialism, we deserved special conditions. We were very idealistic and our, good, our goals were very good, but, dot, 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 but, indeed. Now, the self-righteousness of idealists throughout history, their sea-green incorruptibility, can all too often lead to the murder of their enemies. Robespierre, of course, was the original sea-green uh, incorruptible, thus dubbed by Carlyle, I think, for the first time. Now, he allowed his belief in his own incorruptibility to lead him to instituting with Danton the reign of terror in uh, post-revolutionary France. Now, most journalists I know uh, have experienced too much of the world and the messy compromises you have to make to deal with it, to allow themselves to come out of the closet as idealists. It's not that deep down they have no ideals or principles. It's just the experience of, of the likes of Shabovsky and all these idealists. Uh, leads them to be really adherents of real politique because it is real, it is realistic. Uh, which is why actually the tented down with capitalism camp uh, memo, uh, demo at St Paul's has not much found much favour in Fleet Street itself. Um, we all agree, absolutely, there's no question that the banking system, which is in a mess, that the fat clap bankers should be strung up, well, no, I don't believe that, but <laughs> uh, metaphorically speaking, for the mess they've got us into, plus the fact that they're still earning obscene amounts of money and awarding themselves ridiculous bonuses for bringing the, bringing the uh, system crashing down. And of course, we all loathe them, and particularly the fact that they feel bizarrely rather victimised by the um, excoriation um, of their profession, if you can call it that, their kleptocracy, um, you know, by the general public. But the anti-capitalists offer no solutions at all or even promote viable ideas that might contribute to a solution. Capitalism, like all human endeavours, is of course thoroughly flawed, but it is thoroughly flexible as well. And, it, and moreover, it does enable the freedom that allows the dissemination of ideas, good or bad, to vie for uh, influence in the marketplace. And the fact that this Battle of Ideas conference, this event, is sponsored by powerful capitalist corporations m proves the point. These wicked people are actually paying for us to debate their weakness and so on. I think that's absolutely splendid. <laughs> In a non-capitalist uh, uh, police state like North Korea, those tents at St. near St. Paul's would have been smashed up like the bicycles at Tiananmen Square, which I saw. Um, and their occupants would have been shipped off ages earlier before they even got one tent up. Uh, to the um, concentration camps they have, they were just shot on the spot. And I think there's no more graphic illustration of how capitalism in enables freedom than the pictures by thermo-imaging cameras, which proved that over 90% of these uh, anti-capitalism tents are empty overnight. Their occupants, having skedaddled home, put to comfy beds and hot showers, or nearby hotels with all mod cons. 
who enabled those comfy beds and those convenient hotels to exist? Capitalist corporations. Who created the internet, the smartphones, even the tents and the Starbucks skinny lattes that they're all cradling? Capitalist corporations. Now, our briefing notes uh, said we would discuss whether diplomacy, which used to be private, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, behind closed doors and smoky, smoke-filled rooms, etc. God, I wish there were smoke-filled rooms now. I'm dying for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those were the days. That's why I've got this double bass voice. You know, I'm a very old lady, but I smoke far too much. Anyway, is it being played out in public too much? And the cry for more transparency and everything. Uh, is it damaging the slow, long-term, real politique game of diplomacy and compromise? Frankly, I think it probably is. But part of a real politique means recognizing that the old ways now, lack of transparency and accountability, it's dead or dying. Uh, you cannot shut the doors again. Uh, there's Wikipedia, whistleblowers, disgruntled employees, and of course we hyenas in the press, all of whom now, thanks to the energy and competitiveness of um, capitalism, have the means by the internet and all the rest, YouTube, Twitter, to disseminate views and evidence. And the advantage of cynical old real politics over idealistic unreal politics is that it understands human nature and, above all, it is infinitely adaptable. Are you not just being nostalgic for the old days of rail politic? I mean, I'm so... No! I, I remember what it was like growing up in the 70s and 80s, and it was a very frightening place, certainly. So are we not being nostalgic, really? Hmm. But, but before, and I'll just ask you, hold your, hold your fire. Are, we, are you not being a nostalgic for what was actually an extremely... Uh, unstable and frightening international it wasn't, order. It wasn't unstable. So I'll, I'll ask you. Carl Eric, that was very, I sort of, your uh, discussion about sort of the rise almost of celebrity politics, indeed Brendan uh, discussed well, was very um, interesting, replacing the kind of old uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink diplomacy. But uh, you seem to suggest as a solution that the uh, answers maybe could be found in the international realm itself, more international law, reform of the UN. I just wondered uh, if I could push you a little bit on that to say <coughs> something. And, and also a similar question to Mark. Um, you seem to suggest, again, in, uh, in, as a sort of amelioration to this more chaotic situation, we could look to international law, international justice. But I wonder, just to bring in one of Brendan's points, if we saw during the 1990s increasing intervention it, precisely in the name of international justice and so in international human rights and what would you would you could you uh, maybe th argue that that was that was sort of symptomatic of the increasing uh, unhingedness almost of international politics rather than being a solution so it's just something to uh, throw out and um Finally, Kerry, um, I thought that was very interesting what you were saying about the internal dynamics in China. I guess, obviously, in the West, we often have a very uh, stereotypical view. We see a sort of monolithic state pursuing, clearly pursuing its own uh, material interests, say, in Africa. But I wonder, for based on what you were saying, uh, perhaps that's something that we can't really uh, be certain of, that as we see increasing uh, internal political turmoil and change, we may find that China itself will begin to act possibly in um, a different way, a more even possibly a more unstable way. So just some things to think of. Now, what I would like to do is to throw open the floor to you, the audience. I would like to hear your opinions a little bit about the UN, because a couple of you have actually referred to the UN as an institution we should rely on. And I think most people in this room are well aware of the well, let's say, massively faulty organization is I see the UN with a ma majority of dictatorships in the General Assembly and, mm -hmm. you know, is running the Human Rights Commission or whatever I want to call it. And I, I can't see how the United Nations could possibly be reformed and to trust them is, I would like to see why you actually think that's going to work. Thank you. I just think it's really important to unpackage the idea of, of real politique 
a little bit just to see when it has been in operation and when it hasn't. The high point of real politique is actually just after the First World War. Mm -hmm. Why was it just after the First World War? Why? Because after the First World War, it was very clear whose interests were what interests. It suddenly became very, very clear because diplomatic negotiations were published by the Bolsheviks, for example. It same, suddenly became very, very clear what was actually going on in international relations, that there were, was a play of interests going on. The evolution of that period into the Cold War period, let's not say that the Cold War period was a period of real politique. It was actually a period where real politique was shrouded in pieties. It was shrouded in the pieties of free world versus communism, which doesn't really capture what happens, what happened in Vietnam, for example. So let's, let's be very, very clear that, that even in this period of the 1970s or the height of the Cold War, real politique was shrouded in diplomacy, and diplomacy has always been about concealing interests. Diplomacy isn't just about <laughs> pursuit of interests, it's about con concealing interests. And just to finish, surely the point where real politique disappears is the moment when diplomacy becomes everything. So when the economy via the G20 is run by diplomacy, when the European Union, which governs all kinds of internal affairs in a country, is run by diplomacy. The moment when diplomacy explodes to cover everything is the moment that real politics disappears. You give a very compelling talk about like how uh, politics has become now devoid of interests and it's more PR oriented. But don't you think that uh, with our global <coughs> media culture, this, uh, this PR orientation of politics is to gain a sense of political sanction from them in, within democratic nations to achieve national interests. So do you think, like, uh, uh, take example of, you know, the war mongering before the first Gulf War or the war mongering before the Iraq War in America and in, the, and in the United Kingdom. So don't you think that real politics still exists, but in the garb of unreal politics? I think, obviously, the, the answer to the question, to all the questions in a way, is the limits of uh, domestic real politics uh, require uh, international <coughs> organizations such as uh, the United Nations and look, I mean, I'm sounding like Tony Blair now. If we, we've got to take it away from um, promenading, parading politicians of, of the Blair, Sarkozy, Cameron. You, if, but you also, uh, clearly, have to intervene in lots of different ways. Whether it's to prevent uh, the continuing conflict in the uh, Congo. Incidentally, in order to fog my book, um, I, I write about all of this because I travelled all over with the UN. And I saw the UN act in action in the Congo, in Haiti in the Golan Heights, in Cyprus, that's interventionism. Um, and clearly, certain things that we've been talking about, and such as responsibility to protect, such as the International Criminal Courts, have come through the failure of domestic politi parochial polit politicians, if you like, to do what was necessary in Yugoslavia, in Srebrenica, in Rwanda, and of course the issue of Benghazi as well. And you see, where I take issue with Brendan is I think he saw things with a very British prison. Uh, which is, is important, but, but actually, that's the problem, because I think it was absolutely right on this occasion in Libya, in Libya for the UN Security Council to take the decision it did with Resolution 1973, but it should have taken military command. You, you know, it's very easy to stand back and say, well, look, essentially, uh, we don't, you know, it's 101 reasons why we shouldn't do things, because Blair was an appalling hypocrite. Yes, of course he was. Uh, Blair had lots of business interests in Libya subsequently. Yes, of course he did. I mean, a, a, a totally reprehensible politician in so many ways. But my old paper, Tribune, came out of a reaction to people doing absolutely nothing about Franco and fascism in Spain. And so I'm very delighted, personally, to see Gaddafi out of power. I reported from Libya. It was a horrible dictatorship. But we've got to do things internationally. That's, that's my argument. About the UN. There are... There are at least, there are a few problems with this, of course. The UN is the only international organization we had. They, it was referred to the Realpolitik after uh, the First World War. Uh, Versailles, uh, the idea of a, a League of Nations came from uh, President Wilson at the time. Uh, he planted the idea and got through, but uh, when he get, got back to the United States, the, the Congress uh, uh, put a uh, uh, thumb down. So, so the idea more or less died already, uh, already at its outset. Uh, after the Second World War, we had the United Nations, and uh, with some fantastic ideas, the best, perhaps the most important, is the, the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, but it remains a body, an organization of governments. And governments, as I said, 
they tend to uh, be, at least in half of the 193 nations, uh, uh, less democratic than perhaps most people in this room would like them to be. When we do solve things in the United Nations, and we can solve things, we can solve a lot of things, particularly in the field of human rights and in the field of development assistance and uh, de development issues. But uh, some issues which, which have to do with national sovereignty become very tricky. Uh, and they become, of course, even more tri tricky after 99, when de facto a new moral was introduced into the United Nations in connection with the Kosovo War. When we said uh, na uh, national uh, bo borders, frontiers, are not any more relevant when it is about human rights. This gives, uh, this gives us right, us, the United Nations, to go, to go up. This is one problem. The other problem is, of course, uh, the uh, rather the 65-year-old uh, construction of the Security Council, which reflects the world as it was in 1945-46. Today, of course, it should be at least a, a Security Council of 20, or let's say it's uh, 21, in order that we could have a, a decision. Uh, and. Uh, of course, Latin America, India, South Africa, perhaps, uh, Japan, Germany should be there in order to have a good Security Council. And now I will speak against my, I, my own idea because I would like the European Union to play a stronger role internationally, which we have on the basis of history, democracy, etc., etc. And as soon as you speak about a new composition of Security Council, you, get, you run into a problem as far as who, which European countries should be there. So uh, that wasn't very much of an answer, but... Well, I mean, I used to be a diplomat, so, you know, you have to be very pragmatic with what you are, are trying to do when you have, you know, the, the, the most difficult thing to control really is not domestic policy, but how you interact with other countries. So just two things. One is, um, it's always good to quote Wittgenstein, especially on a Monday or uh, sort of Saturday morning. Um, don't, don't know, just look. And when we look at the US Imperium as Chinese or as any country, it's still pretty incredible. Um, 700 billion US dollars a year on its defense spending compared to the closest, you know, uh, China, 92 billion. Um, 690 military installations in 125 countries. So Wang Hui, the uh, Chinese uh, academic, said, the borders of China come up to all of your borders. Uh, you know, it's not like you can get away from this imperium. I, I don't really see that changing. I don't really see that changing. If it does change, it creates huge problems anyway. So the second thing is, well, I, I mean, you know, I, th I think genuine, gen genuinely, we want a more just world, yeah. I mean, we want a kind of more equitable, a more sustainable world. And the principles that I used when I was a foreign policy advisor were friends are cheap, enemies are expensive. You want lots of smiling faces because then you don't have to pay them. Uh, two, alliances. Um, Kissinger, in his awful book on China, I read it on the way to Beijing, and it was like stumbling off the plane, um, having got drunk next to a bigot for 10 hours and very jet-lagged. <laughs> But one thing he did say that was interesting was, you know, alliances control uncertainty. Klaus Witzin on war wrote about the need to control uncertainty. Alliances control uncertainty. And we have to think very hard about what is the meaning of alliances now. I mean, especially where borders are so permeable. And I guess the final thing is, you know, the conflicts in the future will be about the same damn thing. Land, resources, you know, the kind of things, the physical things that we want. So I, I suppose finally, you know, this, this is a great historic opportunity, really to get a more just, um, equitable world. Uh, a world in which, you know, Indians and Chinese are coming into the global market. They have accepted a lot of the kind of key tenets of modernity. Uh, I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that framework works. And I think our benighted elites uh, in Europe, uh, which has to reform a great deal too. I was at the European Parliament in Strasbourg um, only on Tuesday and Wednesday this week, and I felt like I'd walked into the twilight zone. Yeah. I mean, this needs to reform. It is absolutely mm -hmm. disgraceful that this organization doesn't have more credibility, and it should reform itself. And I think, you know, finally, to quote uh, Mao Zedong, um, there is chaos under heaven. The situation is excellent. <laughs> this idea that somehow the UN is the, our root to uh, a better, more just world is ridiculous. One has to remember they did vote to be the head of their human rights commission, Gaddafi's Libya. Mm. And that was not so long ago. So, you know, that's all nonsense. Secondly, the idea that the UN should go in and, uh, you know, control in liberal intervention. They are useless. 
They're useless in the Congo, as we know. They're incredibly corrupt. Uh, they are um, rapists, frankly, because a whole lot of uh, UN soldiers there were raping underage girls. They were useless in U Yugoslavia. I was there during the whole breakup of U Yugoslavia. They weren't able to prevent the massacres of safe haven, uh, Srebrenica. They walked away. I was at uh, Gorazda, which was a safe haven, under siege by the Serbs. <laughs> Did they prevent the siege? No, they didn't. And in fact, my belief is that they prolonged Milosevic's time in power because all my Belgrade friends are all anti-Milosevic. As soon as the bombing of Belgrade and Kosovo and everything started, they went out on, uh, uh, onto the bridges across the river and they had huge, um, sort of like dartboards on them, target things and say, bomb me now. I, they did not think that this was a good idea. And because of that, he actually lingered in power much longer. That final thing is this lovely idea that the ICC is the answer to anything. The ICC is a disaster because first of all, it is seen by most of the world as a Western construct, which is there to try Africans and Slavs. I mean, how many, you know, Western uh, liberal democracy people have been hauled up there? And then it's not going to be Tony Blair, not that I think he was a war criminal, but, you know, they, it is seen as smug Western liberal democracies doing it. And also, it spins things out endlessly. I mean, Milosevic died before there was a verdict. He was in, in prison. I've got two old war criminal friends of mine there at the moment. And one of them, who is a, a frightfully exotic and frightful man, who called himself the Red Duke, and he ran the Chetniks, um, who did most appalling massacres. And he once told me, uh, when I said, is it true that you said the best way of defeating your enemies, the Croats particularly, uh, is to gouge their eyes out with a rusty spoon. And he said, oh, yes, it's a very good way. He said, but actually it was a sort of joke. The trouble with you British, you don't have a sense of humor. But he really believed it was a rather good idea. Uh, anyway, he is, I think he's been there two years now and he's refusing to answer any charges. He'll probably die there too. You know, justice inordinately delayed is justice denied, as we know. Mm -hmm. So I, and also the other thing, the ICC has managed to make it impossible for dictators to leave um, under agreement and live in a, some cushy exile in Saudi Arabia or somewhere. Um, so they fight on because they have no way of finding a bolt hole. This is typical because this has happened in Sudan. President Omar al-Basha, as soon as the um, business of the ICC indicting him, and he's a sitting head of state, though mind you not <laughs> democratically elected, but that's a mere detail in this world. Um, as soon as that came out, the massacres in, and the ethnic cleansing in Darfur continued unabated, and not only that, they were stepped up. Bashir al-Assad, um, <laughs> God, all um, he, he, he had nowhere to go in any case, but he wanted to. And I think the ICC, the law of unintended consequences, is a very bad idea, as indeed is the idea that the UN should run military operations. They can't do it and they won't do it. Thank you very much. And Brendan, may I ask you to? Um, well, I'm, in answer to your question earlier, Tara, I'm not nostalgic for the old era of real politics or, you know, what came before the 1990s and before the 1980s. Uh, but, you know, there was, at least in the past, there was honesty in relation, there was an element of honesty, not always, but there was an element of honesty in relation to international affairs where you pretty much knew where people stood and you pretty much knew what people's interests were. The problem with the era we live in now is that there is this constant process of mystification. It's not to say that intro crashing interests don't still exist, they do, and people pursue them in various kind of strange underhand ways. But those interests tend to be mystified or suppressed or kind of pushed to one side. So you don't have the honesty that you need in international affairs to work these things out, to work out conflicts, to have conflicts uh, in order that they might be resolved or that things might move on. You know, that's the problem fundamentally with the United Nations itself, which is it acts as a form of 
global mystification mystifies the relationships between states and presents this kind of phony internationalism, which we all know doesn't really exist. It also solidifies the power of the victors of the Second World War, mm -hmm. this extraordinarily unequal institution which presents itself as being full of equal members, which is just not true. Uh, and, you know, the problem with iPad imperialists like Mark is that, you know, they, <laughs> well, they compare... They, they can, that, sorry, you, <laughs> can, you will not get away with that. Can, I'll come back. Yeah, yeah no, hold on, please hold on a second. Let's allow yeah. Brendan. They compare themselves. They compare I don't know themselves. how to use an iPad. <laughs> okay, Mark, I'm Mark, I ask you, you can come back in a minute. Okay, laptop Jesus. bombardier. Okay. Uh, they, they, they compare themselves to the people who took action in Spain in the 1930s, but the profound difference is those people actually went to Spain and took enormous risks, put their life on the line to fight for something they really believed in. Whereas the iPad imperialists, whether or not Mark is one of them, <laughs> stay at home and write articles saying Cameron has to go and bomb Gaddafi. There's a great difference between those two things. And the difference really comes down to the difference between humanism and humanitarianism. Because humanism, I believe, you know, those people who fought in Spain were pretty humanist kind of people. Humanism is about trusting in people's ability to liberate themselves and to run their own lives. That's what humanism is about. Humanitarianism is the precise opposite of that. Humanitarianism is believing that people are incapable of liberating themselves, are pathetic victims, and need to be saved by Westerners. It's more like the white man's burden than it is like the International Brigade. Okay, we've been talking about real politique here. We've been talking about how real politique was the primary way in which states organized their foreign policy before, whereas now there's something different. Well, what evidence is that now states don't organize their policy according to real politique? If you're dropping 500,000 kilograms of explosives on a nation, or if you're using force, there's always a justification or an excuse. Very few nations throughout history have said they're doing something simply because it's in their own interest. They've always claimed morality, and to some extent, aren't they still continuing to do so? One of the issues which seems to be uh, being skirted around, I think, or at least is perhaps not been fully resolved, is the, the future of the nation state. Uh, we talk about national interests or globalization or internationalism. But I wondered uh, whether the panel think there is any future left in the nation state. Much of the, the talk of liberal interventionism is that there isn't and that some entity called the international community will now be you know, the focus of our loyalties and the focus of our actions. Is it the case that you could talk about internationalism in any sense at all today? I would think not. And is that a reflection of the um, collapse of self-interest, um, as Brendan is arguing? And secondly, on Anne's point, about idealism and principles, you say idealism always leads to all these horrors, but isn't Not it always. the lack of idealism and lack of principles that we're seeing reflected everywhere? I mean, I do, I do risk, uh, describe myself as an internationalist, and of course, everybody needs to intervene in many ways. We need to intervene to protect our neighbours, we need to intervene to help from time to time in lots of different ways, but only on, on the basis of international agreement. And I am old enough to remember, as Anne was talking about, the UN sitting idly by in Srebrenica and in Rwanda, and that could have happened in, by, in Benghazi. Um, the military uh, use of force is not always, it's always the last use of, uh, of it's always going to be the last uh, resort. But it's got to come through international agreement and not through unilateral action. And that's why our best hope has to be the UN and international organisations. Because all I've really heard are excuses for really nothing working. Nothing can be improved. You can never have a better idea of how our societies might be. And that's terribly, terribly wrong. And I don't think um, that it's uh, very... I spent most of my time in my life campaigning against wars. Uh, um, I spoke against the war in Iraq, in Hyde Park. I was a member of CND for many years. Now, that doesn't mean to say I'm a pacifist. And you see, Brendan's point is quite a good one at the end because he acknowledges what I was saying, that essentially what motivated those people to fight against Franco was a uh, belief in internationalism and democracy and humanity. And I believe that too. Uh, I don't put my faith in the likes of Blair and Cameron. I have, don't have a huge amount of faith in international organisations, but they remain our best hope. Of course, uh, you could call it honesty, but I would rather, I would rather uh, say that the rules of, uh, of the relations between uh, the uh, communist bloc and the capitalist bloc in the Cold War, they were rather, people knew how to play by the rules. Uh, and they knew very well each other's interests. Mm -hmm. And that was the point. Uh, the, the speaking partner always knew what I want, the other one what, uh, knew what the other one. 
and then uh, it was a, po a polite kind of, of uh, uh, relation. This was, uh, I would not call this honesty, because uh, the official compromises or deals or treaties that were made, they gave the impression that there were a common interest. And their only common interest was, of course, that my interest and your interest can somehow meet in a good compromise. But uh, th this is how compromises uh, do, do, uh, are created. About nation state, I think nation states have difficult times uh, because, uh, part, as I said before, politicians, uh, we, after all, if we wish a nation state to have democratically elected politicians, they have difficult times because their, their platform of power is, has been reduced uh, in favor of uh, the global market. And uh, uh, the only way somehow to defend the national interest is probably together with other countries in the region and defending your own national culture. Uh, the thing which has to be the common denominator both for internationalism and for nation states and for relations with your neighbor, I feel it's a word which has not been mentioned here today, and that is justice. Justice. Okay. Color, the, must stop. Thank, thank you very the much. The difference between rich and poor. Yeah, just three quick things. One, honesty. I think there's a great um, phrase I heard the other day. You know, the reason why the sun never set on the British Empire was because God couldn't trust the British in the dark. And, uh, you know, so I, I think, you know, honesty, no, no, I'm proud of the British history of dishonesty. Um, Stalin was a great admirer of it. He called us the sly Brits. Maoist called us, you know, the slyest race on earth. I think it's a pity that we're not slyer. Um, <laughs> nation state. I mean, Indians and Chinese must be really, really suspicious of this idea that just when the kind of great tectonic plates of power are changing, uh, the West starts preaching about, you know, the era of globalization and the end of the nation state. Uh, but there's no evidence that the Chinese or Indians in their kind of diplomatic behavior are moving from nation statism. And I, I wouldn't blame them. I mean, finally, um, well, I, I really love that phrase, iPad imperialist. And I think um, I am probably an iPad nihilist. My mind is blank. Thank you. Well, firstly, we really need to challenge this idea, this myth, that the problem in, in Rwanda and, and Congo and Yugoslavia is that Western powers sat idly by and just kind of watched. Uh, international. No, and, international yeah. powers. Okay, it's just it, without Brendan. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah. watch, watch the barbarians kind of fight each other. The, the precise opposite mm. is the case. The problem in all those instances was that there was too much intervention, not too little. Uh, in relation to the Congo and Africa uh, and Rwanda, where the French and the Americans armed uh, various sides at different times. In relation to Yugoslavia, where political intervention by various European powers really transformed that into a terrible civil war. Intervention is the problem. To call for more of it in order to sort out is completely bizarre. I'm also an internationalist, but I think internationalism needs to be based on solidarity rather than on paternalism. It needs to be based on a belief that foreign peoples are capable of liberating themselves rather than this idea that they need to be saved by us somehow superior people in the West. It needs to be an internationalism based on respect for other people's ability to run their own affairs. And that's just a practical point also, because you can only become free by fighting for your freedom. It is a complete, profound contradiction in terms to say that you can liberate people from without. You can't. People only become liberated through the process of fighting for their liberation. First of all, on, on uh, realpolitik, I think it, it's much older. Oh, he's gone. Um, <laughs> than, than the period between the two world wars. I mean, me, um, Bismarck, I think, probably really invented the philosophy of realpolitik. And, you know, then there was Talleyrand, who was so devious and so full of realpolitik that when he died, a colleague said, what do you think he meant by that? So, in a way, <laughs> it's an old, old concept. The uh, most real politic people on earth today, and the most nationalist about the nation state is, as Kerry says, China. They are going to lend us money or give us money, so long as we don't mess around with their system in any way, in their ability to lock up dissidents and, you know, block Facebook and everything. They are doing things in their own interest, and the same thing is happening in Africa, because they're now the neo-colonialists in Africa. Uh, they are realpolitik writ large. Now, although I'm more or less in favor of real, uh, realpolitik, because it is adaptable and flexible, I don't think it's going to be that fle flexible 
with the Chinese because they live in terror, as I said earlier, of Luan, which is chaos, because, you know, it is not a united country. It has lots of minorities all chafing at the bit. It's got all uh, the peasants and the urban workers who are being exploited like mad so that these millionaire uh, communists can ride around in rollers and, you know, buy Maseratis and all that sort of thing. So there is the danger of instability in China itself. Uh, and possibly they will be able to stave it off if they start opening it up to their own people. But who knows? Thank you very much to our speakers.